Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. The focus of our session is how to enforce a foreign court judgment in Scotland. So, when might that be useful? The most commonplace example is when a judgment has been granted in a party's favour, say in England, an EU member state or further afield, and the debtor has assets in Scotland. Getting that judgment recognised and enforced in Scotland can give the aggrieved party the means to recover sums awarded by the foreign courts here in Scotland. Today's session provides an overview of the rules governing this complex area of law. As always, we advise anyone in possession of an award from a foreign court to seek specialist advice before trying to enforce it, as there are many nuances ready to trip up the unwary. Your speakers today are Thomas McFarlane and me, Daisy Bobbington. We are both solicitors in the Commercial Disputes and Regulation Division here at Shepherd and Wedderburn. Our team has experience in registering and enforcing a variety of foreign judgments, including successful enforcement of awards from England, France and Germany. Day to day, Thomas specialises in Scottish disputes, in particular professional negligence, shareholder and director disputes and contractual and intellectual claims. I am a member of the Commercial and International Disputes team with a focus on contract, professional negligence and intellectual property. I'll now hand over to Thomas to summarise the points for discussion today. Thanks, Daisy. So an outline of today's session is shown on the slide. We'll start with a review of the rules governing the registration and enforcement of judgments from the rest of the UK and Scotland, Scottish judgments in England and Wales, judgments from EU member states in Scotland, and judgments from the rest of the world in Scotland. We will then look at diligence or enforcement methods which can be used, for example, to recover a debt in Scotland. We will then tell you about a case where we successfully registered and enforced a judgment of a German county court in Scotland on behalf of our client. Finally, we will discuss the likely impact of Brexit on the recognition and enforcement of EU judgments in the UK and vice versa. There is a chat box on your screen, so, so please feel free to ask any questions either during or after the webinar by typing in the box. We will answer the questions at the end, or if there isn't time, uh, we will contact you directly following the session. So, to look at enforcement of judgments from the rest of the UK in Scotland. The procedure for the reciprocal enforcement of civil and commercial judgments between UK jurisdictions is set out in Section 18 and Schedule 6 and 7 of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act 1982. The legislation is UK-wide. However, the procedural rules are set out in the Rules of Court for the jurisdiction where you are trying to enforce the judgment. In England and Wales, the relevant procedural rules in relation to the enforcement of judgments from Scotland or Northern Ireland are set out at Rules 74.14 to 18 of the Civil Procedure Rules and the Practice Direction 74A. In Scotland, the procedural rules used to enforce a judgment that originated in England and Wales or Northern Ireland are contained in the rules of the Court of Session. Both the CPR, applicable to England and Wales, and the rules of the Court of Session here in Scotland draw a distinction between judgments that enforce a money provision, meaning the payment of a sum of money, and a non-money provision, for example, the delivery of goods, or an interdict or injunction. Turning to money provisions in Scotland. So in Scotland, the procedure for enforcing judgments containing a money provision from another part of the UK is actually relatively straightforward. It is dealt with under Schedule 6 of the 1982 Act and with the rule of the Court of Session 62.37, as shown on the slide. A party applies to the court that originally handed down the judgment, say in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, for a certificate of money provision. The certificate confirms four things. One, that the court made the order. Two, 
sums due, any interest, and the dates in which any interest began to accrue. Three, that the appeal period has passed without any appeal being made, or that any appeal has been finally decided. And finally, that the enforcement of the judgment has not been suspended, nor has the time for its enforcement expired. To have effect in Scotland, the certificate must be registered in the Register of Judgments in the Books of Council and Session within six months of being granted. Once registered, that judgment has the same effect as if it were a Scottish judgment of the Court of Session. I will now hand over to Thomas, who will discuss enforcement in Scotland of judgments containing non-money provisions that originate from other UK jurisdictions. Thanks, Daisy. So, in Scotland, a party wishing to enforce a judgment that includes a non-money provision, such as an injunction or a requirement to deliver goods, must follow a different and slightly more cumbersome procedure. That is set out in Schedule 7 to the 1982 Act and Rule of the Court of Session 62.38. Again, this is shown on the slide for you. The party must petition the Court of Session to issue an interlocutor, which is a court order, allowing registration and enforcement of the judgment in Scotland. A petition for registration must be presented at the Court of Session, along with the certificate from the original court and the certified copy of the judgment. There is a standard, standard court fee of £300, which is payable for all petitions. The petition must be lodged in court within six months of the certificate being obtained from the original court, and the petition does not normally require appearance at court by the parties unless um, it is opposed. When the petition has been granted, the court will issue an interlocutor, and that, along with the original judgment, must then be registered in the Register of Judgments in the Books of Council and Session before it is enforceable in Scotland and has the same effect as a judgment of the Court of Session. However, it should be noted that in terms of Section 18 of that, this process only applies to civil and commercial judgments, and even still, certain types of judgments are excluded from enforcement in this manner. Excluded judgments include those of magistrates' courts, judgments in relation to insolvency law, and judgments concerning title to administer the estate of a de deceased person, amongst others. It is therefore important to check what kind of judgment a party is trying to enforce, as this will inform which procedure to use. So, having considered uh, judgments from the rest of uh, the UK, what about the recognition, registration and enforcement of judgments from countries out with the UK? First of all, we will look at the enforcement of judgments from EU member states in Scotland, before moving on to consider judgments from the rest of the world. Firstly, in relation to um, judgments from EU member states, uh, the procedure to, to be followed uh, varies depending on three factors. Firstly, whether the original judgment was contested at any time by the defender in the other EU member state. Secondly, the date the original judgment was issued. And thirdly, which EU member state court issued that original judgment. So, as Thomas has said, when dealing with a judgment from another EU member state, the first question is, was the original court action contested at any stage? If the answer to that question is no, and the claim was for a sum of money, then the streamlined European Enforcement Order procedure can be used. This applies to judgments issued after the 21st of January 2005 in any EU member state, with the exception of Denmark. To obtain a European enforcement order, the originating court must issue a copy of the judgment together with two certificates, one stating that the claim is uncontested and the other setting out the sums due. These documents may then be registered directly in the Books of Council and Session, making the judgment enforceable in Scotland without the need to use the petition procedure in the Court of Session. European enforcement orders can also be obtained where you have a signed agreement from a debtor and their express consent to enforce it. 
For example, in Scotland, a debtor may consent to having a signed agreement registered in the books of council and session, which a creditor can then seek to enforce in another EU member state. The European enforcement orders are predominantly used to enforce civil and commercial judgments, and there are many instances when the procedure cannot apply. For example, a European enforcement order cannot be used in relation to revenue, customs or administrative cases, cases where a state is liable, cases relating to status, property rights arising out of matrimonial cases, wills or succession, bankruptcy, insolvency, social security or arbitration, so many exclusions. However, there are very specialist legislative regimes dealing with cross-border enforcement of many of these types of judgments. So, what other options are available if you can't utilize the European Enforcement Orders Procedure? If your judgment fails the first test, in that it was indeed contested at any stage, or is not a claim for money, then you need to look further. You will need to know when the decision was issued and which EU member state court issued that original judgment. These factors will determine the correct procedure to follow, and I'll hand over Thomas to discuss some of those now. So, if the foreign judgment was issued on or after the 10th of January 2015, then the Brussels 1 recast regulation applies, regardless of which EU member state issued the original judgment. The Brussels 1 recast reg regulation introduced a simplified mechanism for the recognition and enforcement of EU member state judgments, and it applies to all 28 member states. This new regi regime abolished the need for a declaration of enforceability in the courts of the member state in which enforcement is sought. That was known as executor, which was required under the old Brussels 1 regulation. That original regulation still applies to pre-10 January 2015 judgments, and this is something we will consider shortly. Rather like the European enforcement order, the regime under Brussels 1 recast means that parties no longer need to follow the petition procedure in the court of session with the extra time and cost it entailed. A party simply presents a copy of the judgment and a standard form certificate from the original court to the court of session and serves a copy of that on the debtor. The party can then proceed with enforcement. The debtor can contest the enforcement under Brussels 1 recast by making an application for refusal. <coughs> of enforcement. The court has the power to limit the enforcement proceedings to allow purely protective measures, make the enforcement conditional on the provision of a security, or suspend the proceedings in part or as a whole. Matters <coughs> become more difficult if you are seeking to enforce a judgment issued by another EU member state before the 10th of January 2015. These judgments, as Thomas has said, continue to be dealt with under the original Brussels 1 regulation. For registration and enforcement of a judgment in Scotland under Brussels 1, the traditional procedure was to present a petition to the Court of Session together with a copy of the judgment <coughs> with translation, a certificate from the original court and an affidavit from the petitioner detailing the part of the judgment which remains unsatisfied, sums due including interest, and a certificate of currency conversion to pounds sterling. As an aside, that petition procedure applies to the enforcement of judgments from the Lugano countries, being Iceland, Norway and Switzerland, under the Lugano Convention 2007 and Part 5 of Chapter 62 of the Rules of the Court of Session. However, a recent case has identified a lacuna in the law in that the Rules of the Court of Session, as amended, do not provide a party seeking to enforce certain judgments where Brussels 1 still applies with a procedural mechanism to do so. The problem was identified by Lord Brailsford in the petition of Drieker, BVBA and others and Claire Giles and set out in his judgment issued on the 20th of October 2017. The anomaly prevents contested and or non-money judgments to which the Brussels 1 regime applies from being registered and enforced in Scotland via petition procedure. 
Uganda countries are, of course, um, unaffected by this. So in Drika, the petitioners sought to enforce a contested judgment issued by a Belgian court in 2013 in terms of the Brussels I regulation. Unlike Brussels I recast, under the original regulation, the procedure for making an application for registration and enforcement is governed by the law of the member state in which enforcement is sought. The previous rule of the Court of Session setting out that procedure was, however, no longer in force because it had been updated to reflect Brussels I recast. Lord Brailsford held that the petition was incompetent as it sought to rely on a provision which was no longer in existence. Lord Brailsford acknowledged that there was no mechanism in the rules of court for registration of a decree such as the one in the present petition. However, the court considered that the further procedure and additional expense that the petitioner would need to incur to enforce the judgment did not justify innovation on the part of the court. Lord Brailsford ruled out the possibility of invoking the nobile officium, being the court's inherent jurisdiction, to innovate and grant the petition. His lordship noted that the only option available was to lodge a new petition seeking decree conform under the common law. Now, there's been no official response yet to this decision from the Rules Council, and it's not clear whether they will take steps to reinstate the provision dealing with this matter. So keep an eye on our website for any updates in relation to that. In the meantime, any party seeking to enforce a pre-10 January 2015 EU judgment, which does not fall within the scope of the European Enforcement Orders or Lugano, will need to petition the Court of Session seeking decree conform under the common law which involves a more complex, prolonged, and expensive procedure. I'll hand over to Thomas to explain what decree conform entails. So if a party has to go down the decree conform uh, route, then <clears throat> rather than simply lodging a petition, you'd have to raise a fresh court action in the form of a summons, which would ask the court to pronounce the decree in accordance with the foreign judgment. So if a party was seeking the enforcement of a money provision, the summons would seek payment of whatever <coughs> excuse me <coughs> whatever sum was due by the debtor in the original foreign court judgment and ask the court um, to grant a decree for payment of that sum in Scotland. Parties to the action for DT conform must be the same as in the foreign action or show their connection with the obligations of the original parties to the court. Similarly to the old petition procedure, an official certified copy of the foreign judgment must be produced. If translation is required, then the translation must be authenticated by an affidavit before a notary public. <coughs> Once a foreign judgment has been shown to be on the face of it valid, the course of session will pronounce decree conform unless an opposing party successfully objects to the foreign judgment. There are various grounds for making an objection to the decree conform in respect of a foreign judgment, including that the judgment is not final, no longer operative, discriminatory or otherwise offends public policy, enforces revenue or criminal law of another state, <coughs> that the foreign court lacked jurisdiction or the proceedings in the view of the Scottish court involve some irregularity or unfairness. So the decree conform process has an unwelcome level of uncertainty for any party seeking to rely on it. So how about judgments from non-EU member states? Well. Traditionally, the decree conform process is used to enforce a judgment from a court of a non-EU state with whom the UK has no reciprocal arrangement. Those countries include the USA, some African countries, and those from the Middle East and the Far East. As we have said, we must now also fall back on this procedure for certain contested pre-10 January 2015 EU member state judgments in light of the decision in DRICA until such time as the Rules Council remedies the anomaly in the law. There are three important instruments which set down the procedure for the registration and enforcement of judgments from non-EU countries with whom we do have reciprocal arrangements. 
Some of these require executive petition procedure in the Court of Sessions, first of all, and others allow for enforcement following registration alone. Judgments of some Commonwealth countries, including New Zealand, Nigeria, and Kenya, can be registered and enforced through the Administration of Justice Act 1920. The Foreign Judgments Reciprocal Enforcement Act 1933 enables the registration and enforcement of judgments from the high courts of other countries, including Canada, Australia and India, and the Crown Dependencies of Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. The procedures of both regimes is dealt with under Part 2 of Chapter 62 of the Rule of the Court of Session. Like the decree conform procedure, there are various grounds of opposition to registration and enforcement of a judgment. Under the 1920 Act, the court may also exercise its discretion and refuse to register a judgment. The law in this area, as you can see, is fairly dense and highlights that expert advice should always be sought when seeking to enforce foreign judgments in Scotland. For those of you who tuned into our previous webinar on the recovery of expenses, it is notable that in general, when seeking to register and enforce a judgment from a foreign jurisdiction in Scotland, the reasonable expenses or costs involved in the application for registration are recoverable as if they were sums due under the judgment. Such expenses include both court dues and solicitor's fees. So once you have your foreign judgment registered and you're ready to enforce in Scotland, what enforcement methods are open to you? I'll pass you back over to Daisy, who will discuss this aspect. Many thanks, Thomas. So, diligence and enforcement methods. The technical name for enforcing judgments in Scots law is diligence. In this section, we will run through the most commonly used diligences in Scotland. So, firstly, a charge for payment. A charge for payment is a prerequisite to some diligences being carried out such as an arrestment or attachment, which we will look at in a moment. It can often be an effective enforcement method in itself, encouraging a debtor to make payment without further action being taken. A charge for payment is a formal demand specifying the sums due in terms of the decree, the cost of serving the charge, and usually an amount of interest. The charge for payment is served on the debtor by an officer of the court of session called a messenger at arms. That's akin to an English bailiff. It allows the debtor 14 days to pay the debt, and if the debtor fails to pay within that time, the creditor can instruct messengers to carry out diligences to recover the sums due. Important to note that a charge for payment expires after two years. So an important form of diligence is arrestment. Arrestments are used where money or movables belonging to a debtor are held by a third party. The arrestment is served on that third party and stops them from transferring the money or movables to the debtor. So practical examples of this include earnings arrestments served on a debtor's employer or bank arrestments served on a debtor's bank, freezing funds belonging to the debtor until such time as the debt pays. Another form is attachment. Under attachment, goods belonging to a debtor are seized with a view to their ultimate sale by auction. The messenger will prepare an inventory and value the property. The attached items may subsequently be auctioned and the proceeds distributed to satisfy the debt, subject always to the court's discretion not to do so. You might look to use attachments where, for example, a debtor has a shop or warehouse containing valuable goods. Moving now on to inhibition. Now, this is one of the most commonly used and effective diligences. An inhibition is an order prohibiting the debtor from dealing with their heritable property, either by transferring title, selling it, or by burdening the property with standard security mortgages. Insolvency procedures are also relevant here. A creditor may use any unpaid debt, including a debt under a foreign judgment, which has been registered for execution in Scotland, as the basis of a petition for the sequestration bankruptcy of an individual or for the liquidation of a company. These can be very useful diligence tools particularly when dealing with individuals who hold directorships and are keen to maintain them, 
or with companies who are keen to maintain their reputation and hold on to their business. So now that we have discussed the process of registration and enforcement of foreign judgments in Scotland, as well as the diligence methods available, we thought it would be worthwhile summarising a case we have dealt with where we successfully registered and enforced a foreign judgment in Scotland, achieving a great result for our clients. We were instructed by a leading English firm who had in turn been instructed by their partner German firm to register and enforce a judgment obtained in one of the regional courts of Germany. The original judgment was a damages award of €20,000 plus interest and expenses following the assault and personal injury of a German resident in a bar in Germany by three British males. Judgment was issued in February 2007 holding the three Brits jointly and severally liable. Two of the defenders resided in Scotland and one in England. Now, the judgment was registered in England by the English agents. An agreement was reached with the defender residing in England that they would pay a monthly sum towards the debt. At this point, we were instructed to register the judgment in Scotland. Now, that was relatively straightforward as the English agents were already in possession of the required certificate from the German court as well as an authentic copy of the judgment to be registered and an English translation. <coughs> Following on from that, we drafted the affidavit on behalf of the petitioner, setting out the background, the part of the judgment remaining unsatisfied, <coughs> excuse me, the sums due and the addresses in Scotland for service in respect of the petitioner and defenders. The affidavit was sent to Germany for signature by the petitioner and we obtained a certificate of currency conversion from one of the major Scottish banks, which stated the pound sterling equivalent of the sums due in euros. And this was obtained within a matter of hours uh, via our banking relationship manager um, here in Edinburgh. Now, we instructed the council to draft the required petition pursuant to the Brussels 1 regulation, as this was before the DRICA case and the repeal of the relevant rule of the Court of Session allowing that. The petition, along with the judgment and the translation, certificate from the regional, uh, regional court, affidavit and certificate of currency conversion were lodged in court and the petition was granted within a matter of weeks without any appearance. <coughs> now, we served the interlocutor on the two defenders in Scotland and this was not appealed by them. And we then registered the judgment in the books of council and session. To enforce the judgment, we served charges for payment and then earnings arrestment on the two defenders. And as a result, they finally agreed to pay the sums outstanding by way of monthly instalments, similar uh, to that of the, the third defender who was uh, located in England. So we signed the defenders up to fully enforceable and registered minutes of agreements. And in all, uh, this was a great result for our client who had really um, gave up hope of recovering any of the sums uh, due to him. Now we'll hand over to Daisy for our final section on the potential implications of Brexit. Thank you, Thomas. So as we have seen, the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments relies on principles of international <coughs> cooperation and reciprocity. A central part of this in recent times has of course been the regulatory regimes brought into force as a result of increasing European integration. The rationale underpinning the Russell regime in this area is the free movement of judgments within the EU, facilitating the successful operation of the internal market. It is clearly in the interest of both UK and EU businesses to retain some form of reciprocal regime to allow the swift enforcement of judgments across borders. The commercial certainty and streamlined processes afforded in particular by European enforcement orders and the Brussels 1 recast regime is undoubtedly a valuable commodity. It would seem though that the ultimate arrangement regarding judgment enforcement between the courts of the EU member states and the UK will very much be guided by the agreement reached concerning the UK's access to the single market. It has been suggested by some that we may join 
European Free Trade Association, allowing us to take advantage of the Lugano Convention 2007 to deal with the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. Until the terms of the Brexit deal are finalised, however, everything is, of course, speculation. What is clear is that further primary legislation and rules of our domestic courts will be required in order to give effect to any agreement ultimately reached. In the short term, nothing really changes. The main issue which needs to be remedied in Scotland is the current lacuna in the law as it applies to pre-10 January 2015 EU Member State judgment, which is something we do expect the Rules Council to address. The European Council's negotiating objectives do provide that the recognition and enforcement of national judicial decisions handed down before the withdrawal date should continue to be governed by the relevant provisions of EU law applicable before that withdrawal date. If this objective comes to fruition, litigants will continue to use the existing Brussels 1 recast regime for any judgments given before the date of the UK's withdrawal likely, of course, to be the 29th of March 2019. So it's really a case of watch this space and keep an eye on our website for updates on the topic. In particular, we would draw your attention to our dedicated Brexit Advisors webpage, a link to which is shown on the slide now. So today's webinar has really been a whirlwind tour of what is a complex and detailed area of law. If anyone else has any further questions, then please type them in the chat box now, or alternatively, send us an email after the webinar using the details on the final slide, and we'll try to answer your questions directly. <clears throat> that concludes part two of our two-part series. Um, thank you all for taking the time to, to tune in and listen. There is a link on screen now which includes the recording to our previous webinar on recovery of expenses. <coughs> which is a comparison between Scotland and England and Wales, and just in case you missed it. And if you're interested in, in reading more about the two topics covered in our webinars or dealing with dis disputes in Scotland in general, then we now have a handy guide to Scottish civil procedure, which takes you through the key stages and considerations when handling a dispute in Scotland. There's a preview of the guide uh, shown on the screen just now, and Please just let us know uh, if you'd like a copy of it uh, by emailing us um, using the details on the slide, and we'll send you out a copy either uh, by email or, or hard copy. Uh, similarly, if you're tuning in at a later date via our website uh, on Vimeo or YouTube uh, and would like a copy, then again, please just uh, send us an email uh, and we'll uh, send one out to you. And that concludes um, today's webinar. So. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and good afternoon.